Hello and welcome. My name is Lance Albertson. Um, I'm here with Peter. We're going to be talking about uh, building open, free and open source software on ARM64 and PowerPC64 Little Indian. Uh, first thing about me, so you know a little bit more, um, I'm the director of the open source lab at Oregon State University. I started there in 2007 as a CISM in, and I've been promoted to director back in 2011. Uh, I manage about seven to ten undergraduate students that help me manage all the systems. Um, over the years, I've been active in the open source community, starting out with the Gentoo infrastructure team, doing various things with the Gennady project, and now more recently, I've been fairly active in the Chef community. And uh, my name is uh, Peter Pouliad. I'm focused on developer ecosystems and advocacy here at Ampere Computing. I've worked on uh, open source projects and technologies professionally since 2003, including uh, GNOME, uh, SUSE Linux, uh, OpenStack, and the Power Virtualized Device Driver Stack for Windows on uh, virtualized on KVM. Uh, and my background is primarily in data center operations and infrastructure automation, uh, continuous integration, and uh, hypervisors. So here's a little summary of what we're planning on talking today is we'll start out with an introduction of what we're going to be talking about. And then from there on, we'll be uh, w discussing why it's important to pro provide access to these various architectures, how projects actually get access with our systems, the history behind uh, the power ecosystem and uh, uh, AARC or ARM64 at the Open Source Lab, and also technical challenges for the platforms that we've had throughout all of these years. So the first thing, let me a little, talk a little bit more about what the OSU Open Source Lab is about. Uh, you can kind of think of us as, as a co-location hosting company for, for open source projects, but we're a little bit more than that. Uh, we provide really a lot of various uh, uh, services for projects, whether that is just server co-location or what we've been doing a lot more of lately is private cloud hosting. Um, we've been primarily using a lot, lot of OpenStack and Gennady in the past. Um, we also have a popular software download mirror, ftp.osusl.org. Uh, that is geographically uh, separated between the West Coast, mid Midwest, and East Coast. Um, and we also offer a lot of managed hosting for a lot of projects that uh, don't really want to deal with the SISM and tasks. We'll, ha we'll handle that for them so they can just focus on making sure their project is awesome. The other side of it is, is that we provide experiential learning for a lot of uh, project or a lot of undergraduate students at Oregon State. So a lot of our students uh, get hired on, we pay them, and they get hands-on experience managing systems, whether that's actually in the data center, which has kind of gotten more difficult to do with uh, uh, folks having access to that, um, or they actually uh, uh, you know, manage systems more directly. So, for example, uh, they work really closely with open source projects from around the world and interact with them, whether they're in the United States, in Europe, in Asia, wherever. We work with them day to day. Um, I also help to teach them learn and current new DevOps practices and technologies as best as we can. And a lot of our alumni that have gone through here have been really well known in the ecosystem. For example, um, CoreOS was started by uh, uh, two uh, open source lab students, uh, Alex Colvey and Brandon Phillips were both from the open source lab. So we're, we're, we, uh, we are quite known throughout the ecosystem. Um, currently I'm the only full timer and I have about eight undergraduate students that work for me. So uh, my name is, as I said, Peter, and I'd like to give you a little background on who Ampere Computing is. So uh, Ampere is uh, essentially a, a chip vendor who uh, we've designed the first uh, server microprocessor architecture from the ground up, specifically designed for uh, cloud computing. Uh, in this architecture, obviously, it's a 64-bit uh, ARM processor. And we uh, chose that to uh, basically try to optimize the efficiency of the um, <clears throat> data center workloads uh, in the, you know, specifically for cloud computing. Um, you know, and our essentially our goal is to be the uh, the industry leader in power efficiency for uh, core density, and uh, you know, basically try to help establish the new normal of. Uh, scalability in the in the data center so uh yeah essentially i guess in a in a nutshell we're a arm 64 processor uh provider and we're essentially the looking to bring arm technologies into the server uh ecosystem space all 
right. So uh, why is it important to provide access to ARC64 and PowerPC64 Little Indian? Well, for one, both architectures are becoming more widely used in, in various ways. Um, as was mentioned in the keynotes, uh, uh, ARM64 is going to be used quite a bit more, especially with Macs, which will be interesting. Uh, Amazon Web Services also has provided a lot of ARC64-related uh, instances that you can, ru can run and provide cheaper for uh, your use. Uh, but right now, typically, most open source developers rely on things like Raspberry Pis, which aren't really the best for doing a lot of compilations. Um, there's obviously some performance limitations, and then depending on the nuances of the Raspberry Pi, it maybe doesn't relate to other things such as what's on AWS. And also running any kind of uh, continuous integration and development pipelines with Raspberry Pis isn't really the best way of doing it. Um, the other thing is that I think a lot of Raspberry Pis are still using 32-bit binaries on a lot of their stuff, and really what you need is a 64-bit. So we really need to provide a platform to do this. On the PowerPC side, um, uh, PowerPC has been a major role in the high-performance computing and in AI and GPU-intensive environments, especially in some of the major cloud play, uh, players. I know they're using PowerPC quite a bit for that. Um, the problem is, is that the hardware is generally very expensive and, most, and very difficult to obtain. There really isn't like a an easy development platform. I think there is one uh, uh, company that is providing desktops for this, but again, it's not as uh, easy entry as, such as like the Raspberry Pi just to get some easy access. Um, but for those systems that you can get, it requires additional knowledge on how to set up and manage those systems, which can be problematic for a lot of open source developers. Um, and really, if you want to manage these properly, you want to have some kind of support contract and uh, to deal with any kind of hardware failures or any other things that you can you run into when you run this type of hardware. So really, that's that's kind of the things you need to think about. So for for, for open source developers, uh, you want to make sure that your software works. And in the most part, most software recompiles with not many changes. But sometimes, depending on how the developer has written the code, there might be some x86 specific assembly code or other things included that might cause compilation issues or even some runtime issues. And to fix those, you know, developers, they might, you know, try and run things in an emulator slowly on their laptop or whatever, but ideally it would be nice to run it on actual bare metals machines uh, to make it work a little bit better. Um, these developers really need to have easy access to debug and fix issues. Um, in addition, a lot of these architectures have specific uh, compile flags that you want to have enabled to boost the performance on that architecture. So you want to be able to test that and make sure your software is working properly. And for downstream users that use this, so for example, all the users that are spinning up instances on AWS, they expect their software just to work out of the box. Uh, no matter what architecture you're running on, they don't want to deal with, oh, this is, oh, this is running on a different architecture. Now I've got to go down the rabbit hole of why does this one little thing not run correctly and all that. They expect everything to work. And so it's really important that all of the software out there that people use will work on whatever platform they expect. In addition to that, a lot of open source projects rely on some type of a CI CD pipeline to ensure their software is, is, is uh, working properly and also for doing releases. And so the other part is, is we want to make sure that all of these new architectures work seamlessly with this, whatever CI CD pipeline they use. Because um, this often catches bugs and issues much sooner uh, in a lot of development related areas. In addition, if they want to be able to provide binary artifacts so that users, downstream users can use it easily, they need to have some kind of access to that to do that easily. Um, so this really makes it a lot easier for users to use their software and so forth. I remember when we first started doing this with PowerPC, uh, we were using Packer to build our images. But at that particular time, the Go language hadn't been really compiled and ready yet for PowerPC. And so it was, I was kind of in a chicken and the egg problem for some of it. So I had to do things a, a little bit manually. And we actually got the Golang project on our platform. And then they eventually started building things that we could use. So it was really cool to be able to be a part of that um, and make that move uh, going forward. So let's talk a little bit about the history of uh, Power and uh, ARM at 64. ARM64 at the Open Source Lab. So let's first talk about Power, because Power has been a part of the lab for the longest time. Um, we actually started doing uh, 
hosting back in 2005 just on a simple Power 5 server, and all we had was shell access to do it. Um, at the time, only a couple of projects used it. We didn't give them root access, um, but it was, it was a nice start with it. Uh, and then by the late 20, 2000s, 2010s, so forth, we started hosting more systems with Power 7 servers. And our collaboration with IBM was getting uh, much more formalized, which was really nice. Um, at that time, we were using LPAR technology with IBM, which is kind of a pain for people that are really used to how cloud works right now. And we spun up, they're basically like virtual machines on these systems, and we spun up about a dozen different projects to kind of get them going. And then at that point, we also started hosting some dedicated hardware for some projects. So for example, um, one of them was the GCC compile form project was one of the first users of that. Then in 2011, uh, we started using OpenStack quite a bit. Um, and that was primarily because the Power 8 platform changed quite a bit how uh, these systems were run. And, and the Power 8 system also switched it over to Little Indian. Because before then, everything was big Indian with Power. So we first started out with pre-development machines that were actually Power 7 Plus machines that had different firmware on it that allow us to run it like a Power 8 machine so we can quickly test that. Um, but we, we made the switch in using OpenStack to be able to make it really easy for us to provision virtual machines on these systems and also deal with any kind of storage uh, requirements that we have in the long term. After a certain time, we replaced all those pre-development machines with Power 8 and now Power 9 machines. And at this point, uh, with Power at OSL, we have around over 100 projects uh, using this system uh, over just about 10 machines, and it's, it's working really, really well. That picture is one of the uh, um, systems that we, I think, I think are one of our storage nodes that we have with that. Our, our uh, history with AR64 uh, at Open Source Lab is fairly more recent. Um, and about last year, about this, or actually back in February, uh, Ampere Computing reached out to us, and we started a discussion of how we can provide um, act, uh, ARM64 access to open source projects. Um, I kind of told them the story of what we did with, with uh, Power, and uh, with the Open Source Lab, we kind of treat ourselves as the Switzerland of open source projects. Uh, we really are try to be agnostic to whatever company or platform we provide as long as, you know, the project needed. So we, we pitched that idea, and they were really receptive to that. So um, as, as things moved along, we finally received a shipment of 12 servers. Um, there's a picture of the server that we got. Um, we got the Ampere Computing EMAG 2U servers. It, it's in a Lenovo-based uh, branded machine, but it's running ARM. Um, and we finally got some contracts finalized at the end of uh, December, and finally I racked the servers, and I got OpenStack all deployed at the beginning of this year. And uh, finally, in May, once we finally got some kinks worked out, we got fr our first initial projects running on the cluster. So um, we're ready and open to get a lot more projects running on these systems right now. So what are some of the goals with providing to this access? The first and foremost, foremost goal is ease of access. We want to make sure that the project can get access to the hardware as simple as this, having an SSH key, and they log in, and that's it. That's one way we can do it. Um, alternatively, we can give them access to the web console or the API access to the OpenStack cluster so they can do a little bit more things, but generally that's all the projects need. They also depend on reliability. They expect this resource to be stable. They, they expect it to run. They expect it to be able to run with their build pipel pipelines as, as they expect. The other part is performance. They expect these systems to perform at a decent enough level to make them useful. Uh, so we want to make sure that we provide enough CPU, RAM, and disk resources. Now, the way we have things set up, we don't primarily do this in a manner that is good for doing like benchmark testing. We, we, we keep telling people that because sometimes they want to do ben benchmark testing. But since this is a shared resource, we, we can't do that. So we're doing performance in this expect expectation that things work good enough to be able to do the compilation. The other thing we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure we had expandability and being able to grow as more projects were added onto the platform. So we wanted to make sure that the architecture and the way we designed the cloud platform was easy to do that. And thankfully, OpenStack and Ceph for storage made it a lot easier to do that. The other things we provide, uh, that we pride ourselves in at the Open Source Lab is flexibility. Every project has a different requirement on how they want to host or how they want to manage their project and how they want to host things. And so we try to be as open, as flexible as possible with those requirements, within reason, as much as we can. Um, so we, we try to do our best with that. 
And the last thing is we want to reduce that burden of maintaining the actual physical hardware that projects have. A lot of projects tend to work with some of these uh, vendors directly, and then they have the headaches of having to deal with uh, managing when hardware failures happen and, and, and support contracts and all of that. And the nice thing with us is we've been doing this for so many years. We know how to do it. We know how to interact. We know how to make sure that all they have to worry about is that a VM is up and it's working. And we also work to maintain that we handle upgrades for any firmware or even on the hardware and so forth. So that's kind of the goals that we wanted to provide with this. So how do projects get access? Well, for Power, we have a, a uh, form that they, 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 they put stuff in or they put information in. So here's a picture of what it kind of looks like on the website. Basically, the workflow is, is we ask the simple questions to learn more about the project. The form is submitted into our ticketing system, which is RT-based. We wait for approval from an IVM representative to kind of have a thumbs up saying, hey, you know, yeah, that looks like a good thing we want to be able to provide. And it, also, that's just kind of just make sure, like, is this a legit project? Is it something that seems to be impactful enough to require to get access? We obviously can't take every single project that gets access, but we want to make sure that it le uh, meets a certain kind of bar. Um, we typically get access granted within three business days. I have a student that gets assigned that task, and they, they go ahead and they do that. They get it added to an announcement mailing list so that if we have any hardware issues or other issues, they know about it. And then the other thing that we do is uh, troubleshooting issues. So if they have any issues with their instance or anything, they can send an email to this email address that goes to our ticketing system directly. And then they can work with the open source lab to diagnose the problem, whether it's a software issue or it's an actual issue with uh, the architecture. And then if things happen, we can escalate that to IBM as, as needed. So that's been a really bit nice benefit with the power side of this. On the ARC64 site, it's basically the same thing. We have another form for that. Um, we ask the same kind of questions. We wait for approval from an Ampere representative, which is currently Peter. Um, and we go through the same thing where we, we get them added, we get them on a mailing list. Uh, we have a separate email address to deal with any kind of support tickets. Um, they work with us on any kind of uh, <clears throat> issues that happen. And also, uh, if there are any issues, we can escalate that to Ampere as needed and we can you know, work through issues that we run into. So we try to make that pretty easy. So here's what the platform actually looks like from a cloud point of view. So everything is running on top of OpenStack. That provides the API-driven platform for managing all of these various resources. We have a web console so they can, have, uh, they can get on a VNC basically onto the system if they want to and kind of do some reboots if they want to to check that out. Um, we're currently using the Rocky release. Um, we're a Red Hat or CentOS shop at the Open Source Lab. And so we're using the Red Hat distribution of OpenStack called RDO. And we also use Chef to manage all of our things. So that's how we manage our systems. Uh, currently, we only provide compute block storage and image storage. Um, we, we are considering adding additional services that uh, OpenStack provides, but it's basically based on what projects need and if they need those, and then we'll work on adding them. Um, currently, we only have IPv4 support, but we will be adding IPv6 soon to our OpenStack. Um, from a hypervisor point of view, everything is using KVM. Um, we're actually using the QMU KVM EV package, which is basically a Red Hat patched version that has some in, a, a more up-to-date with some nice patches included with it. And then on the storage side, we're using Ceph, with, which is a nice network storage, easily expandable side. Um, Power actually has our own cluster because they got hardware donated to us, so we have that working while the ARC cluster shares one that the OSL built. Now, before when we started all of this, it... Um, <clears throat> We actually started all with local storage, and that was great to start out with, but we quickly ran into scalability issues. So we have definitely gone through a, a, a transformation over time of moving everything to SEP, which has made things a lot easier for dealing with storage on this. On the guest operating systems that we support, we try to support as many as we can within reason. So we try to aim for all of the Red Hat-based ones, whether that's CentOS, Fedora, RHEL itself. Um, currently for RHEL, we don't have any kind of license currently, site license, but we're hoping to get that now that there's the, the new collaboration well, with IBM and, and, and Red Hat working together. So we'll see how that works in the long term. Um, but we can at least have the image up, and if you have a license, you can get that going. We also have all the Debian-based ones, the main ones. We have Debian and Ubuntu. We currently only target the LTS releases of Ubuntu, uh, but, we can add, <coughs> um, but we can add more as we see. 
Um, we also have a, an OpenSUSE Leap instance or a guest image as well, because uh, there's a few users that want that. But that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, if you have your own image that works with OpenStack, we can certainly get that going. Um, we, there were some users that actually still want to do a lot of support on PowerPC 64 Big Indian, um, and they were able to do that on their own. All of these images are built using Packer. Um, I have a link there that goes to our te Packer templates, which include actually everything that we have, whether it's x86, PowerPC, or uh, ARC64. <clears throat> so let's go over some frequently asked questions. First off, we'll talk about power. Do we support Big Indian on, on, on uh, power, otherwise known as PPC64? Yes, we do. However, a lot of the upstream distributions have stopped building for PowerPC64. Or <clears throat> And so there's older releases that we still have on the platform for guest images, and you're welcome to use them. But as time goes along, we're not going to be able to support it in the long term as those end of life. Um, and also IBM has really shifted all of their focus onto uh, Little Indian. Can I get access to bare metal machines? It depends on the size of the project and the use case. We have a couple of projects that are using that. Uh, Debian really likes to have full control over their, over their hardware for security reasons, so we, we do that. Alpine Linux also has their own node. And we also uh, can also do a various things. Oh, FreeBSD also has some access as well. If you do need some temporary access to debug an issue, we can probably do that. We have one system on the side that we kind of use as our test system to kind of do that, and we can kind of use that as needed for that. Um, how does the OSL get the hardware? Right now, IBM either donates or loans the hardware. Uh, the nice thing about the loaner systems for the open source lab is that includes all of the hardware support for the life of the system. So we don't have to pay for anything on that. But we technically don't own the hardware. However, donated systems, they come with a standard warranty, and once that expires, then we have to pay for that warranty, which can be expensive depending on the hardware. Well, that's a lot of the facts on that one. On the AOC64 side, do we support ARM32? ARM yes, we do for ARM v7 and 8, 8A. This is helpful for the newer users of the Raspberry Pi. Um, I currently don't have any images right now, but the images are a little bit uh, more cumbersome to work with on the cluster, primarily because uh, the way the systems work on the uh, ARM64 is they require EFI to boot, and most of these uh, ARM32 systems don't support EFI out of the box. So we end up having to boot the systems with an external kernel and init RAMFS. But I was able to test this and get this going and uh, plan on having some, some uh, image for this fairly soon. Currently, though, there is no uh, full, fully virtual or fully hyper virtualized support for ARM v6 and below. That basically is the original Pi 2 and 0. Um, but we might be able to do emulation, but I don't know if that's really going to help or anything. But if we get a lot of requests with that, we can take a look at that. We're really targeting ARM64, though. Can I get access to the bare metal machines? Yes, and it depends on the use case and for how long. Uh, we currently don't have any projects uh, having a full access to a system, but we can certainly change all of that since we just started. Uh, the next question, how do we get the hardware? Well, Ampere Computing currently loans the hardware. Uh, they include the hardware for the full hardware support for the life of the system, and it also allows Ampere Computing to send us newer models as they become available. So that makes it a lot more flexible for us to deal with that. How do we fund the, the both of these projects? So. A lot of these require some kind of way of, of paying for my salary, the student salary, and other miscellaneous expenses. Currently, IBM does quor quarterly, uh, quarterly cash donations, or they have been for several, several years. Um, and this last year, we actually switched to a formal contract with deliverables. And so that's a lot better for us because it's a multi-year contract, and we know exactly how much money we're getting, and we can allocate that. So that's been really good to do that. Ampere Computing, we just started out with an annual cash donation, and we might switch to them to the formal contract eventually. But that, that really helps us make sure that we can keep this, this, these systems going and maintain them for the long run. So there's obviously some nuances between running these systems compared to running it on uh, your regular x86. So on the power side, um, they have various models that they have. They have the L line the, and, and the Open Power LC line that are most common with running Linux. So the outline is what actually looks like a, a regular IBM box. It, it looks like a regular IBM box. And that actually can run in two different modes. The PowerVM mode, which is the L parts I talked earlier, 
that talks to an HMC, which is a hardware management console. Um, and it's a system that basically manages all of the systems and it can call home for support requests and things like that. Um, or it can run an Opal uh, firmware, which is um, an abstracted uh, firmware mode that makes the system essentially boot like a regular, it looks like a regular system. Um, and I can access it with IPMI and all of that. Um, but that requires no, having knowledge that there's a service processor on there that you have to log into and then change the setting in there to get it to Opal. Um, also, there's no VGA output. It's only serial. So that's also kind of a, you know, if you're used to dealing with x86, that's another thing you have to deal with. Um, all of our Power 8 systems currently, at least on the compute side, are all these L lines. On the newer systems, they have another line called the IBM Open Power LC. And these are actually super micro chassis, which was pretty wild when we got them. Um, I was like, is this actually a power box? It looks like a regular machine. But sure enough, it is. It runs power. Um, but that one only supports the Opal booting. And you actually can just plug in a VGA cable in the back, and it boots up. And you're there, and there you go. You can manage all that systems. And it uses IPMI as well. Firmware is also a little bit different. Um, on power, it boots up into an environment called Pet Petit Boot. It's basically a really fancy bootloader that's running Linux. So you can actually get into a bash prompt or a shell prompt. I think it's running BusyBox. And you can run various utilities, such as setting up maybe hardware, RAID controllers, um, and, the, and those various things. You can also do net boots from there as well. Um, the other nuance is that between the different lines, up, actually updating that firmware is different. And you have to read the documentation on how to do that. So that was kind of, kind of interesting to deal with. On the Ampere computing side, um, the BIOS is very similar to the x86. It very much acted like an x86 box. Um, the only other thing that was different is that it, EFI was required for booting. So we had to update some of our uh, debt booting systems to support EFI. Um, all firmware updates currently, I could tell, only work through the BMC web console, but it worked seamlessly and I didn't have any issues. Um, it'll boot via the VAGA or via, via the serial. On all of our systems, we try to actually redirect everything to serial so that it's easier to, to connect uh, remotely and can kind of see what's going on. So the systems are really simple to use, which is really nice. Let's move on to the technical challenges that we run into. So the first one is general binary package availability. In the most part these days, binaries are available, uh, but there still might be a few things that aren't available. And most of that is if you're trying to get things outside of what's already included in the distribution, you might have some issues. So one example is um, we've been using the upstream repositories from Docker to use their binaries since they're generally a little bit more up-to-date than what you can get from the distributions. However, for PowerPC Little Indian, they aren't building those anymore. They, they were building them, but they haven't been building them. But, but you know, if I have the system, I can work through and build it, but it's kind of annoying to do that. So I might have to revert back to using the distribution versions of that. Um, so that's good. The other part is with OpenStack. So um, right now, everything, uh, at least uh, if you're a CentOS-based uh, system, and I think the same is probably a, with Ubuntu as well, all the binary packages that you need to run are available and on Power and on ARC64. Um, but early on, this was not the case. So I ended up having to build some of these things manually and have my own repository. Thankfully, with OpenStack, it's mostly just a, power, uh, a Python application. So a lot of those were just uh, no-work uh, packages, so they, I didn't need to rebuild them. But there were a few things that needed to be rebuilt that I needed to do. So that was a fun thing early on. But thankfully, when we got the uh, ARC64 machines, I didn't have to do anything. It just worked out of the box. Um, even to configure OpenStack, I just had to make a few minor adjustments, and it worked. Um, one thing to note with Power, we cannot migrate instances between Power 8 and Power 9 hypervisors, um, but we can certainly spin up new instances between the two. So uh, on the KVM side, there was some really a lot of problems on the Power that we had to deal with, or things that we needed to deal with. So uh, SMT has to be disabled on the hypervisor or hyperthreading essentially. Um, otherwise, the system doesn't work properly. Um, Later on, we also ran into CMA memory, which is contiguous memory allocation uh, on the Power 8 systems. At a certain point, we couldn't spin up VMs, even though we had plenty of actual memory available in the system. The actual CMA memory on the system was, um, was full, with, and it was kind of based on how Power does the virtualization layer. 
So we had to do a little bit of a, uh, a kernel tunable when we booted the system up. <clears throat> so we had to work around that. We actually had to use a mainline kernel to be able to see how much CMA memory we had because the, the version that came with CentOS doesn't display that at all. So we had no idea how much memory it was. The other thing to note with on guest, you must install this package called PPC64 Diag. And that allows for hot plugging devices. So if, you're, if you want to have the ability to be able to uh, dynamically add interfaces or uh, disks and so forth, you need to have this installed. And this isn't really apparent when you first do this. And a lot of the upstream uh, guest images that were created don't always include this sometimes. So you kind of have to think about that. One nice thing is that booting guests between uh, Big Indian and Middle Indian is easy. You basically just uh, install which, whichever ISO you want that works. It works the very same way as doing a 32-bit and 64-bit 64, x86, I mean. Um, and I already mentioned about the mainline, but we've, we've really been using the mainline kernel to get the latest features and fixes for a lot of the issues we ran into. So we try to follow the latest LTS kernel upstream and build our own internally. Um, we try to have the configuration as close to what CentOS has with a few other minor uh, adjustments to it. <clears throat> when Power 9 came out, support was really special for CentOS 7 and RHEL 7. Um, basically, the kernel they had originally for it just would not work. So they had to create a, a new kernel specifically for it. And so do the installation was really interesting. <clears throat> um, but uh, with uh, CentOS 8, RHEL 8, that's not an issue. It's actually a first-class citizen of the of the of the operating of the platforms right now, so that works really well. On ARC64, um, all the guests must boot using EFI, so this requires hypervisors having a special package installed called the ARM Architectural Virtual Machine Firmware, or AAVMF, um, that provides that special EFI uh, firmware that you need to have. And it also required some special QMU flags to get this working with Packer initially. So I had to set some, uh, some settings on the machines, and then I also had to point to the BIOS. Um, thankfully, OpenStack just knew about this uh, all, already, so when I spun up instances, it would automatically do that. But when I was wanting to build my own images with Packer, I had to make sure I included that in there. On the hypervisor, very little changes I had to do. I don't have to deal with SMCP or anything. Um, we're only currently running in a known issue that Ampere knows about using the 10 gig NICs that we're using that are causing some random mockups. Um, thankfully, we seem to have mitigated most of this by using a mainline kernel, but it's still happening now, now and then, but hopefully this will get resolved later on. So, oh, I guess that's uh, at, at the end, so we can open this up for any questions if anybody has any. I don't see any questions right now. Peter, do you have anything else you want to add to this? Uh, no, just if there's anybody uh, listening uh, from any particular open source project that is interested in uh, hosting, please, uh, you know, follow the links included in the presentation to, uh, you know, send in a, a request and uh, we'll do what we can to expedite uh, access as soon as possible. Oh, we got one question. Are the slides going to be available? And I'm assuming, yes, this, these will all be uh, published uh, once everything is done here. I'll make sure of that. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to see uh, growth and expansion on the ARM64 systems that we have and getting more projects on that. Yeah, I can say just from my own experience, you know, working with you, Lance, and some of the other uh, projects I'm working with in the, in the community, there's definitely a need for server-based ARM computing in open source uh, development ecosystems. Uh, what I've found is in most cases, as you mentioned earlier, it's only, uh, you know, their only frame of reference for ARM-based computing is Raspberry Pi hardware or some of the other tinker boards. And uh, I, I know for a fact when they get to use a ARM server platform that has server conveniences like uh, remote management and, uh, you know, a lot of the other capabilities you typically find in, uh, you know, the data center grade server platforms, um, they get really excited. 
So it's a uh, yeah, it's it's an interesting space to be in to see uh, you know a lot of the change that's occurring in the data center. Uh, you know, having um, you know working for an ARM server company and having uh, you know seeing what you can do with real ARM computing power and data center from a density and compute. I think it's going to be real interesting, uh, you know, to see what happens in the future. So it's good times for, for ARM computing, I think. Yeah. One thing I was going to note that I, I didn't put in the slide is when I got these systems all rack and running, um, one of the most amazing things I noticed was on the ARM 54 systems, when I powered everything on and got everything working, the power being used in that rack was so much less than what I was expecting. Um, I think I figured out the, I, I have a top of the top of the rack, a, a regular one gig switch, and then two Arista 10 gig switches in there. And I think out of that rack with all the 12 systems running, the, the Ampere systems was only using 60% of the power in that rack. The rest of it were all the other systems. I think they were running at maybe, what was it? It was like 170 watts each, I think, idling or something like that. Um, it's quite amazing. You can pack a lot of these systems into a, a rack and, and not have to use a lot of power. Um, ironically, the power systems consume a lot of power, especially if they have GPUs connected into them, which we have a few of them, and they, they are very loud when they turn on. But, but yeah, that's, that's one of the amazing things I like about these systems is their power consumption. Yep. Just to add to that, you know, as, as the computing density increases, right, the physics of the rack doesn't really change. You can only really get so much electricity into the same amount of physical space. So one of the you know challenges that we're trying to address is you know specifically you know trying to address from Ampere is specifically building a platform a computing platform that will allow you to achieve the maximum density possible while uh, you know being as efficient as possible uh, you know um, and uh, hopefully getting as much compute into the same physical uh, space with as many cores. Um, you know, to, to build and, and uh, be sufficient for cloud operations, right? So, um, yeah, it's yep. uh, very, very, you know, I think we're trying to address the problems that you're going to see, especially in times like this where people are being driven towards, you know, cloud computing and service providers, um, you know, the need for more efficient computational power is definitely, uh, I would say, high on it, on uh, those uh types of providers lists and, uh, you know, being able to work for a company that provides a solution uh, for high performance computing uh, that's efficient and, uh, you know, also uh, optimized for, uh, for cloud native platforms is, is, is uh, extremely fun and, and entertaining at the same time. <laughs> yeah. One thing I was also going to no uh, note is that, um, one nice thing about us getting involved in this early on, especially, I know we, we encountered that, that one NIC issue on the Ampere system, but also on the power side, when we first started this, we actually ran into some bugs and issues that were discovered before they were released to the GA. So we were actually great to kind of be their Q&A in a way of testing and uh, being able to catch these things before maybe the bigger providers run into that. So. That's one experience that I really, am, am, you know, it's a pain for me if I have to work around an issue, but uh, it's also nice to know that I'm helping out down the road. And the other thing I was going to mention was um, it's also been great working with both Ampere Computing and IBM. They have both have been really supportive. Neither one of them has been saying, no, you can't do that with them. And, um, you know, I was, uh, they're really excited to know that we're both providing access to all of these architectures. Obviously, they each have their own, you know, business cases and what they want to do, but it's great to be able to work together and being able to provide platforms for whatever architecture that is needed in the open source ecosystem. Well, I don't think there are any other questions, and I don't have anything else. Um, I think with that, we can uh, end this session. Thank you all for coming here, and uh, I hope you enjoyed our session. And if you have any more questions, our, our uh, contact details are there on that slide. Thank you, everybody.